All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to this IDEA Community Talk, um, one of a number of co IDEA Community Talks and TWED Talks we're doing during the fall 2020 term. Uh, tonight, we're excited to have uh, Joe Peterson, uh, who's a PhD student in, Joe, you're in the in Systems the Engineering Department, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you're kind of a idea talks, but you work uh, uh, in part with uh, Professor Kristen Bennett, which she's explains, my yeah, which explains your existence here. Um, mm -hmm. I will uh, I'll keep this introduction short, but uh, uh, if people, if you have questions, uh, Joe has invited you to speak right up and, and ask the question when you have it. You could also put it in the Slack. I've, I've discouraged Joe from paying attention to the, well, the, the chat, the WebEx chat, um, but I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. And if, if I think the question should be asked, I'll, I'll speak up um, for it and interrupt Joe. So without further ado, oh, and also just a reminder, this is being recorded. We will um, link to it from the, idea.rpi.edu uh, portal. Um, so it'll be available for uh, posterity. Um, with that, Joe, take it away. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to, to come listen to my talk. Um, so um, today I'll be talking about privacy attacks in the context of machine learning. And most of the content comes from uh, the two works uh, listed there on the title slide. Um, the, the, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the, the purpose of my talk will be to give an introduction to the survey, to the study of privacy attacks in the context of machine learning. So hopefully you're not all uh, already very familiar with uh, the idea of privacy preservation um, because it will be a very introductory talk. I'm gonna start by defining what privacy preservation is and giving some very basic examples and then going over um, a taxonomy provided by Rogaki and Garcia in a, in a, paper, in a survey that they did um, that was published uh, this past summer um, that includes the different types of attacks and a, a threat model that they developed. Um, and then lastly, to discuss some important factors to consider. So, so hopefully if you're not already familiar with privacy attacks, and hopefully you're not very familiar, uh, by the end of this, you'll have a little bit uh, better appreciation of them. So, so what is privacy preservation? So, so these um, statements are from the book, The Algorithmic Foundations of Differential Privacy by Dwork and Roth. And uh, you know, they say it's a promise made by a data holder to a data subject that you will not be affected in any way by allowing us to use your data in any study or analysis. So that's a, a pretty strong statement. And what's seemingly at odds with that promise is that um, presumably whoever's conducting the study or doing the analysis is eventually gonna want to release some information, right? They're, they're gonna wanna publish some study findings. And so the, the key question is what can they release without breaking that promise? And you know, so if the intent of the study or the analysis is to learn about a population, then uh, perhaps that promise can be kept um, if whatever is released is somehow only about the population and doesn't contain any information about the individuals. Um, but obviously, there, you know, that's unfortunately very challenging because whenever we use data to learn, uh, we risk that what we learn isn't completely about the population, you know, th that we're instead learning about the particular sample that we're using. And, you know, so if whatever information you release um, has some information about that sample, then that could lead to a breach of privacy. So to get an intuition for this, I'm going to present uh, some examples. Um, the first couple are just um, completely fictional. So please take a moment to, to read this and, and decide for yourself if you think this release would be privacy preserving 
Uh, you know, if you want to venture a guess, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Or else I'll just give you a minute to, to think about it. So, so I'm, uh, thank you for participating. And and you you've said what what I you know think I would have said, and what I think maybe a lot of people would intuitively say. But actually, um, some of the literature that I reviewed to include the book mentioned by Dwork and Roth, I believe those authors would argue that yes, this is privacy preserving. And so it's for, for a very sort of nuanced reason. And and what it has to do with is that yes. This individual's um, this individual was adversely affected by the results of the study that were published, um, but they were not affected by allowing their data to be used in the analysis uh, because the results of the analysis had would have been the same if that individual did not take part in the study. And so, I mean, you know, obviously that's just an assumption that one individual didn't impact. Uh, the statistical significance like it wasn't that close but so the key idea here one of the key ideas is that um had this individual decided you know i'm, I'm not sure i want to include my my information in your study um i'm worried about the results um and they decided not to include their information they would still have been adversely affected because that one person withholding their data wouldn't have changed the results of your study the results of your study are about a population. It's not about any individual. It says that smoking causes cancer, and that's a, a general statement. Uh, sorry, go ahead. So I was just going to say, I gave my answer because I misread what this question was or what what this assertion was. There's, there's like a, a couple different pieces to this. First of all, okay, this person took part in this clinical trial. And it actually, and I guess your point and the author's point is, it doesn't matter actually whether or not they took part in the clinical trial. Yeah, that, actually, that, so that, that, that clinical trial involving and something was learned about smokers. Then, second, the second point is the health insurance company knew that the individual smoked. They didn't discover it by something that was revealed by the study. They just knew that they smoked. They ticked the box. This, the individual checked off the box, they smoked. The insurance mm -hmm. company uh, read the study, their insurance company raised the premiums because uh, for them, for that individual, because they smoked and smoked causes cancer. And yes. that would have happened that that person had undergone that study, that it, it, it happened, they were a smoker. <laughs> Yes, yes, and yeah, so maybe I didn't um, write it clearly enough, but yeah, that is, what you just um, outlined there are uh, two of the key points. One key point is that um, even though it is absolutely true that the results of the study adversely affected the individual, because without the results of the study, the insurance company wouldn't have known that smoking causes cancer. Of course, this is hypothetical or fictional, but um, even though it's true that the results of the study adversely affected the individual, um, it wasn't because the individual allowed his or her data to be used because the results of the study are about a population, not about an individual. And the results of the study, number one, uh, would have adversely affected the individual whether or not they included their data in the study. Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, that, that's the main point. And so I'm not gonna really talk too much about differential privacy in this talk, um, but uh, Dwork and her colleagues, um, her collaborators um, have done many years of work on differential privacy and that concept, the concept of deciding whether or not to include your data in the study and, and would the outcome of the study be impacted by one record being removed, that has like sort of central to the idea of differential privacy. Okay. So, so here's another example. If I can get it to 
advance. And again, I'll, I'll just give you a couple seconds to just think about it and then we'll discuss. So um, this also, I'm sorry, not also, but this would not uh, be privacy preserving. And I, I personally, when I first, um, you know, learned about this, this whole field of privacy preservation, I would have found this very counterintuitive because in the one hand, it seems like you're just releasing a population total, 18, that's it, the number, 18 undergraduates are HIV positive. Again, if, in case you didn't see it at the bottom of the slide, this is fictional, but, um, you know, there's nothing that seems like it would be identifiable to any individual. There's no birthdays or names or, you know, or even any demographic information. It's just one number, really, 18. Um, but the 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 tricky part here is that if you um, take it as sort of a general rule that a population total is privacy preserving, where you really run into trouble is when you have multiple queries of the same kind. And so if on the October 23rd, it was released that 18 were HIV positive, but two weeks prior, it had been released that 19 were HIV positive. Now, all of a sudden, everyone knows that uh, the number changed in a two week time frame, uh, which is very specific. And, you know, if, if people try to investigate and are able to find out through other sources of information that no students were admitted during that time frame and exactly one student dropped out, well, then they may be able to identify that, you know, this student who dropped out. Um, is HIV positive, that individual's privacy. And so uh, the main culprit here is auxiliary information. And, um, you know, auxiliary information is any information that, you know, wasn't included as part of your information release. And in this case in particular, the auxiliary information is, is linked to the information you release in a, what's called a linkage attack. And, in all of the literature on privacy preservation that I've been reading, you know, there's no sort of limit on what auxiliary information an adversary may have. It's amazing sometimes what they assume uh, the, the adversary may have access to, and, and we'll see an example of that coming up. And so some of the techniques, for example, differential privacy, um, actually prove that they are immune to any auxiliary information because you just can't know ahead of time um, what information an adversary may have access to. Um, so, so you can't count on an adversary not having access to certain information. If they have access to some information, but your release allows them to, to breach the privacy of other information, then you, know, then you could be liable. So to show yes, that this is- um... Yes, please. Yeah, so regarding this auxiliary information, I know that at the time uh, you make the release, uh, you know, it's not possible to know uh, what, you know, are the auxiliary information that will be available. But, you know, if you can um, have a very strong guarantee that uh, there will not be any auxiliary information, maybe, you know, due to the nature of uh, the, uh, the insight that was just released, uh, then can you claim that um you know uh for example like you know rpi had uh, you know students just for one year like you know hypothetically speaking right uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, rpi made that disclosure that 18 uh, out of uh, whatever 6000 students uh, uh, were hiv positive right so uh, because there's no room for any auxiliary information and you can uh, hundred percent prove that there will not be auxiliary information. In that case, can you uh, say that? Uh, it continued to be a year of innovation for AMIA. It was the first time we needed to shift all of our events. Okay, uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, so if you can prove without any, um, uh, uh, like without a doubt that you know there will not be any auxiliary information, then you know, uh, can you say that? Uh, privacy is preserved in that instance? 
So um, I guess I've never seen in the literature where they're able to somehow prove that there can't be any auxiliary information, but I would say, um, you know, given the way you described it, you know, if you can somehow prove it, then that would be great. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if you can mathematically prove it or whatever, then you've, then you've proven it. Um, but I would say that in, in most of the literature that I've seen on privacy preservation, yeah, they don't make any assumptions uh, limiting what an adversary can have because, you know, if you can't somehow prove uh, that an adversary can't have that information, then the idea is they might end up with that information. And so I think with um, uh, with with people just doing research in this area, um, the exercise is somewhat academic, but people who, you know, are actually in charge of private information, you know, there can be extremely steep fines for any privacy breach um, or it can affect their entire business because people could lose faith in them. So I would say they're, you know, they would want to see that mathematical proof um, that that um, you know that it's impossible for an adversary to uh, to be able to breach privacy. And I mean that's that's in in some extent what differential privacy and some of these other techniques are. Although they don't make any assumptions about the auxiliary information uh, that an adversary can have, but but nevertheless, what they're doing is they're they're proving mathematically a certain level of privacy. Um, and so, but there yeah, are things, things, sorry, there are things that you could do to weaken the effect of auxiliary information, such as in that, to use your HIV RPI example, if instead of giving a precise number for, for either, you know, the, the, number, stu the, the number of students infected or the, the population, by saying there is, you know, say, between 15 and 20 students of this in this population, uh, were infected by HIV, that that eliminates the effect of having auxiliary inform information or, or definitely weakens it because you don't have that precise number. You can't do that off by one uh, mm -hmm. linkage attack that you you demonstrated. You know, oh, so yeah. That's, that's, so actually what you're describing, I'm not sure you're familiar with differential privacy, but what you're describing is exactly differential privacy the uh, the the seminal paper on it by Dwork and her colleagues um, was called um, something like calibrating noise to to queries. And so the idea was, you know, like you just said, you you can't give an exact answer. It has to be a noisy answer. And and they compute um, what how much noise you need to add in order to ensure a certain level of privacy. And then they they uh, basically then quantify it in terms of like a probability. Um, if you add a certain amount of noise, then there, the probability that that um, the information can be breached, you know, goes down as you add more and more noise. And that's what their their whole differential privacy is all about. All right. So Joe continues. So, so, <laughs> should, another follow up question, if you don't mind. Yes. Oh, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so this uh, PATE analysis or PATE analysis, I don't know if you'll go to that uh, in your presentation. So, yeah. but, you know, those analysis, like, you know, does that consider uh, availability or non-availability of auxiliary information? Because I'm, sure. I'm yeah. not familiar with PATE analysis. Okay. Uh, I'll, you know, link a paper because I was reading up uh, on that recently because I'm doing some side work on uh, federated learning and differential privacy. So I came across, uh, you know, um, that work. So I'm I'm just curious. So I, I'll let you continue. Okay. Yeah. So just to show that this, you know, all this isn't um, academic, I actually have a real world example that, that maybe um, people are familiar with the, the, the famous Netflix challenge. And uh, in this challenge, Netflix provided over 100 million movie ratings um, from approximately 480,000 of their subscribers. And the, the, the data that they released, um, it, you know, the goal was to have people compete to try to make a better movie recommend system. Uh, and the winning team would win a million dollar prize. That's how important it was to them. Uh, the data, each row of the data was a user ID, which was, you know, just a random integer. And we'll just, uh, for the sake of argument, assume that there's no way that you could connect that 
random integer to any actual person. So it was, you know, the movies that they watched are really the ones that they rated and the date that they rated them and the rate that they gave them from one to five stars. So you can think about whether or not this is privacy preserving. And you could probably, um, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so you're familiar with the research already. And yeah, if it, if it was privacy preserving, it wouldn't be in, in my talk. So it was shown, it was, you know, shown that uh, two researchers were able to de-anonymize the movie ratings. Again, it was a linkage attack. And, and this time they, uh, they linked it to something called the Internet Movie Database, which is a publicly available database. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, users can have accounts and they can rate movies. Um, if you select a particular uh, user, you can see all of the movies rated and, um, and the date that they rated them. Uh, now you might think, so if, if users are publicly reviewing movies, then you know, was this even a breach of privacy? Um, but the, the issue is that some of the people reviewed certain movies that they watched publicly, um, but they considered other movies that they watched to be private. And so, for example, it was reported that in In the Closet, Lesbian Mother sued Netflix for privacy invasion, alleging that the movie rental company made it possible for her to be outed. I'm sorry, Isabel, are you saying email the slides to you or can you see my screen? I mean, I'll, I'll definitely email out the slides after the talk. Um, yeah, no, I apologize, but I didn't get the WebEx link, so I missed the oh. first part of your talk. I was going to glance through the slides rapidly, if you could share them, either, you know, in the link or by email, in, in the chat or by email. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. Um, let me see how I can do that. Joe, don't worry about it. I'll email them to her. Okay, thank you. Um, so. Actually, there were four Netflix users that filed a class action lawsuit against Netflix, and Netflix reached some sort of a settlement. Um, I don't, I couldn't find how much they paid out to these people. It's probably undisclosed, but uh, this just goes to show that privacy is, you know, can can be costly. And um, you know, according to the Netflix Prize article, um, Netflix did take steps to perturb the data in order to protect information about subscribers. They didn't describe their perturbation technique because they wanted to keep it secret, but apparently whatever their perturbation technique was, it wasn't sufficient because it resulted in um, this lawsuit. And uh, in the United States, there's actually a Video Privacy Protection Act that makes it illegal for the wrong for disclosure of videotape rental records. So um, this example is an example of uh, auxiliary information that is referred to as microdata. So like the idea is basically, you know, if, if you watched um, Rambo 3 in January of 2020 and Home Alone 2 in February of 2020 and Terminator in March of 2020, et cetera, um, you know, eventually, you would be the only person that watched that exact combination of movies on those dates. And so even though there's no, you know, names or socials or birthdays, things that we typically think of as identifiers, um, there's no demographic information or anything. Um, just the fact that there's so much information and that it's very unlikely for any other person to have that exact same combination uh, can make you identifiable. And in terms of auxiliary information, here we see sort of like the worst case scenario like we were talking about in terms of how much information an adversary might have. So if you were to release a data set had these features X1, X2, all the way to XD, what they are, and, and you believed there's no way there's that anybody can, um, you know, there's no auxiliary information. I mean, nothing stopping the person who gave you that data from publicly releasing all but one of those values about themselves. They could post it on Facebook for whatever reason. And you might think, well, why would they do that? Who knows? You don't know if they're going to do it or not. 
But the thing is, is if, if they can, if somebody can then use those D minus one values that that person released to find that one bit of information that the person didn't want released that they consider to be private, um, then, then if somebody is able to use the information you released to find that one secret bit of information, then that's a, a privacy breach. Um, so therein lies the challenge. And that's where I guess um, all of the liter literature I've seen um, typically tries to uh, show different techniques that are, are or are not privacy preserving. And they, they usually assume that the adversary has access to, to a lot of information. So um, I was going to go over just a, a taxonomy of attacks. I, I'm, this, I'm new to this topic. And, um, you know, Rigotti and Garcia, Rigotti and Garcia, um, they had a taxonomy of attacks. I just added one to it that I was able to find that was, didn't fit well in the other four, um, the, you know, the re-identification, for whatever reason, they, they didn't have that as a, as a separate type of attack. Um, I'm still looking through other literature. I'm interested to see how many different types of attacks are there. At first, um, Professor Isabel and I uh, looked online and it seemed like there was just a plethora of different kinds of attacks. But when I started digging into it, it kind of seemed like they all fell into these um, five categories. So I was just going to briefly describe them. So an attribute inference is when um, the adversary infers a particular attribute of some row of the data. Um, this is also called a reconstruction attack or a model inversion attack. So if you've seen those names, um, it seems like all three of these are the same. You know, it's called a reconstruction attack because the idea is that the adversary is reconstructing, reconstructing the training data. Um, I want to uh, point out that the attribute inference itself, itself doesn't mean that the, the adversary is inferring an attribute about a particular individual. It's just that they're inferring an attribute about a particular row in the database. Um, they would then have to link that to other information um, it, unless the database itself had personally identifiable information in order to link the attribute to a particular individual. So um, often when they talk about an adversary doing an attribute inference attack or, or people design different um, attacks, they're trying to show that they can um, reconstruct some you know, percentage of the records in the, in the database or some non-negligible percentage of records. But I mean, obviously, if they are able to successfully reconstruct even the attribute of a single individual, I mean, that single individual um, could sue you uh, or file charges or whatever. So um, even a single individual would be a privacy breach. Now, there's sort of a distinction between actually reconstructing the data or just sort of probabilistically coming up with values that are likely. And, you know, that sort of begs, okay, well, how, how confident does the adversary need to be for it to actually be a privacy breach? And I don't think there's any hard, fast rule on that, but um, people have measured the adversary's success. Uh, the literature says in two different ways. Um, the first way is, measuring uh, an adversary's success compared to an adversary that does not have access to the model, assuming that, you know, that you've created some model. Um, I haven't read specific papers that use that. Um, the survey talked about it, but to me, that can sound like the best way to do it because going back to the smoking causes cancer example, um, if an adversary had access to a model that said smoking causes cancer compared to another adversary that didn't have access to that model, then you know an adversary might be able to infer an attribute that says likely to get cancer, yes. Um, but that would be, again, learning about the population as opposed to learning about an individual. Um, and you know that the adversary would be just as likely to be able to infer that about somebody in the training set versus not. So that's why I think that the, the second measure listed there is better and that's measuring the success of an adversary um, at inferring an attribute value for an individual in the training set versus an individual not in the training set. So 
Uh, another type of attack is re-identification. Um, I'm not sure why Rogaki and Garcia didn't list it. Um, you know, it's determining that a particular record in the training set uh, corresponds to a particular individual. I guess, technically, um, when I thought about it, you know, if if there was some individual that uh, identifying information like a social security number that was an actual attribute in the training data, then perhaps re-identification could be considered equivalent or I guess a special type of attribute inference. But I mean, if there was nothing in the training data uh, that was an attribute that was inferred, um, then it seems to me like re-identification would be a separate type of attack. And, um, you know, so obviously if you conduct an attribute inference with a re-identification, that's how you're then able to identify an attribute of a particular individual. Uh, this is quite uh, abstract to us. Can you give us some um, specific examples? So um, like the, the Netflix example that, that I gave would be an example of re-identification. So you had, um, you know, a database that didn't have any identifying information. It just had movie ratings and dates. And the researchers were able to link that to the internet movie database that also was just movie ratings and dates. But the idea so, is- How is that different from the link attack in that case? Um, that is a, a linkage attack, but it's a linkage attack to do re-identification. Linkage attack wasn't one of the different types of the taxonomy's attack of attacks. I guess I didn't list that as a separate um, category of attack because I think of linkage as how you're doing the attack. Whereas I guess the taxonomy here, the four that were listed by Rogaki and, and Garcia, and then the one that I added, um, each each type of attack is attacking something different. So an attribute inference is what are you trying to you know, what private information are you trying to uncover? You're trying to in uncover the value of some attribute. Re-identification, what, what private information are you trying to uncover? You're trying to uncover the person who corresponds to a particular row in the database. Um, so linkage isn't like some specific thing that you're trying to learn. It's how you're trying to do it. So I didn't um, list that as like a in the tax of attacks, um, but I did talk about it earlier. Okay, okay, I, I, I get it. I get it. So, so the, the, the problem is then, uh, uh, I guess it's, it's clear that, that each individual has an ID. Yes. Uh, somehow, you, and uh, even though that ID is not published anywhere, I mean, I, I, it's just where I'm a little fuzzy here. Does this re-identification means, means that you find the ID or that you find an individual even if it's not identified i'm not sure well so the the idea would be um you know even um in the example that i gave with um sorry one back with the idea of you you released how many students at rpi are hiv positive and you know that one release by itself uh, might not reveal any information about an individual, but if it, if that same um, population statistic is released on two separate occasions and, and it differs by one, then those two releases can be combined to now give people the information that in that two week period, um, you know, the number of HIV positive students at RPI changed by one. Now, if they are able to link that to other information, like information about students dropping out and students being admitted, and, and if they're able to determine from that, uh, and, and it doesn't even have to be in a database, it could be students at the school just know that some student dropped out, and then they are able to learn that no other student dropped out. Now, they, they personally know this student dropped out. Now they know that that student had HIV. And uh, if you know if no other student admitted during that time, so it's linking information that could be in separate databases, or it could just be information that people know. It could be information that is found on Facebook. It could be you know information that the that the um, the person themselves put on Facebook that 
that is information that that they're not that they don't consider private, but then somebody links that information to the information that you release, and now they've identified a particular person. And so the idea with identification or re-identification is they are um, they are linking a particular person to um, information that you released. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have membership inference. So membership inference is inferring that a particular record was used in the training set. And just like attribute inference itself wasn't linked to a particular individual, it was just inferring an attribute for some row in the data. Um, membership inference doesn't have to be linked to a particular individual. It's just inferring that a particular data point uh, was used in the training data, exists in the training data. Um, if you combine a membership inference with a re-identification, then you know a particular individual was in the training data. Um, in terms of auxiliary information for membership inference, um, again, I, uh, through a lot of my literature review, I've, I've been surprised at how much auxiliary information the adversary may be assumed to have. And in, in this case, for membership inference, sometimes they assume that the adversary has some sort of master database that, that has all of the data um, on all of the people. It just doesn't, the adversary just doesn't know which rows of the database were used for the training data or not. Um, and so the adversary might have a lot of information and, you know, for membership inference, you don't want the adversary to be able to learn um, you know, who was in the training data or not. And they give different examples. Some of them seem contrived to me, but like the idea that if participation in the in in some study was voluntary, but somebody might be um, you know, looked down upon if they volunteered to participate, you know, they might their employer might fire them or whatever. Um, so the idea is you know, if you if you're promising to somebody, please take take part of my study, or you know, let me use your data, and nobody will know that you were part of my study. Well, then you have to protect them from membership inference. Um, some other examples were given is the idea if if if, some, if it can be inferred that somebody was in some pharmaceutical trial, then their health information uh, may be compromised, or if it, it can be inferred that they were a patient at an abortion clinic, they might consider that to be private. And inference I've seen also in the literature referred to as tra a tracing attack. I, I haven't seen a distinction between the two. Um, one thing that's interesting noted in the literature is that membership inference in some ways is, is um, easier than attribute inference in that there are, there are machine learning settings in which attribute inference is provably impossible and yet membership inference is still possible. Um, and attribute inference and membership inference seem to be the two most common types of um, privacy attacks examined in the literature. And like I said, with this whole taxonomy, I'm trying to understand um, what all of the different types of privacy attacks are. And when I say types, I mean categorized by what is being attacked. And, and so, so far, I only, I've only had five. Um, Three of them seem very popular. Before I discuss the last two, property inference and, and model extraction, I think it would be good to go over um, the threat model. Could um, so at the at the danger of of uh, slowing things down, could I ask you just a really quick question on the previous slide? Yes, um, and it was actually something I, I think you clarified things for me with with a, a point that you made. So the idea here is that there is some unique, some distinctive attribute such that um, by linking with other data sets, um, you, could, uh, you could find an equally unique attribute. You could join up that attribute. You could find a value of that attribute within this master data set and know with confidence 
that this individual or a, a very, very tiny subset is was in that training set because of yeah. the uniqueness of that. But you're you're not necessarily referring to things like geographic information, are you? You're you're talking about like some other uh, or maybe you are, or or some other just some characteristic. So that... I haven't discussed how and and actually in this talk, I definitely won't have time to talk about how you do a membership inference attack. Um, right now, this taxonomy is just the different types of attack categorized by what information is being attacked. Um, well, I know I, I was just trying to understand. I, I, I was trying to come up in, in my mind an example of that, that like I was imagining you've got like, uh, you know, not heart rates or something, but you know, there's some measurement. Okay. Well, so so one one way that people do a membership inference attack that I've seen in the literature is um, if a model was trained on particular training data, then um, what what people will do is they will if they have access to that model, they will feed data through the model and um, they will try to uh, use the output of the model to determine if it was likely that that data point that they used as input was oh, the right. data that was trained the model. And one of the ways that they do that is they will actually, um, if they have an idea of like the general distribution that the, that the training data came from, they will train many similar models. And then they will feed data through those models, knowing for the, for the models that they trained which data points were in the training set and which data points weren't. And then what they'll actually do is then they'll make a meta model that is um, kind of like a discriminator in the sense that it's to predict um, if the data was in or not in the model. And so if they can get that, that model, that, that predictive model to work, um, then they'll use that predictive model um, with the model that they didn't train your model, and they'll use that to predict for each point that they feed into your model um, if it was likely that it was part of the training set or not. So you should continue because you're never going to finish. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So I don't know how I can maybe cut it short. Um, I would say that, yes, these types of attacks um, are independent in that they're each a different category, but they can definitely be used together. And so, for example, um, when I talk about property inference and model extraction, um, I'm going to, you know, if I have time, talk about um, why people would do a property inference or a model extraction. And so so that I can get to that before I sh show those two, I just kind of wanted to go over this threat model so you can understand the different parts at play here. So this is the threat model for Gaki and Garcia. And, you know, there's training data that, that is, you know, needs to be kept private. And then there's a model that's trained on that data. And then there's some sort of API that um, the person who uses that model um, accesses the model through. And the adversary is assumed to have the exact same access as any other user, because you, you don't know if the particular user is or isn't an adversary. And they, they um, potentially even have access to the model. Um, they distinguish between black box attacks where the adversary um, doesn't have any knowledge of the model. All they do is, you know, submit a query and then get a response, sort of like machine learning as a service, versus white box attacks where the adversary is basically given the model. Um, and, but ultimately what they want to learn is the private information if they're an adversary. Um, now, I slightly modify this. First, I, I point out um, sort of the difference, like, um, between cryptography and statistical learning. So in cryptography, uh, you know, you have secure data that you're trying to deliver to some recipient and the adversary is trying to intercept it or listen in, and you want all of the information to go to the recipient, but no information to go to the adversary. Um, in statistical learning in the literature, uh, you know, it's a very different setup where the recipient may be the adversary, intentionally or unintentionally. They may be somebody who's you know, has nefarious purposes in mind and is trying to breach privacy, or they might be somebody who's just, you know, trying to use the data that you're giving them access to. Um, 
But if they use it in the wrong way, you know, in some study and they publish own findings, you know, it could be that their release of information breaches the privacy of data that you were responsible for. And in all of this, um, I'm ignoring any sort of uh, security concerns about like physical attacks or cyber attacks. This is all just information flow. The key question is what information can be released? And so I wanted to combine their threat model with sort of the model of HealthGAN, which is um, the generative model developed by Yale et al., uh, the research group that I work with, Professor Bennett, Professor Isbell. And so in their workflow, they have a secure environment in which they train a generator, and then they export that generator to the external environment. And so I, I kind of thought something like this was missing from the threat model from McGrocky and um, Garcia. And so um, first I just added that in, um, you know, you have this API that sits at the boundary right there and uh, information can flow back and forth from the user through the API to the model and back. Um, this setup right here is what they called an active adversary. And that's one that has access to the model as it's being trained and can potentially use that access to learn more about the model or about the algorithm, the hyperparameters, or can even potentially influence the training of the model. So they call that an active adversary compared to um, what they call a passive adversary, which only has access to the model after it's trained. Um, I refer to both of these as connected adversaries in that you have something that's behind a secure environment that you obviously feel like you need to protect, and yet you're allowing somebody to interact with that through some API. And so that's very complicated because this API has to know what information it can release and what information it can't release. And as we've seen earlier, that gets to be very complicated. Um, so I have this horizontal line that I've added to distinguish between the development phase above the dash line and the deployment phase below the dash line to show that, you know, this adversary only has access to the model after it has been developed. And with these slight modifications, then I, I also show the HealthGAN workflow. Um, this is a disconnected adversary because the model is trained um, during the development stage, but then the entire model is deployed, um, is just released the deployment stage. And so the adversary is not connected to anything that needs to be secured. Um, there's no API that needs to be making decisions. Um, now, obviously, you, the, the only decision now that you have to make is, is it privacy preserving to release this model? Uh, but you, you know, so you have to do whatever analysis it takes in order to make that decision, but once you've made that decision, um, then you're then you're done. So, with that understanding of the different components involved, uh, property inference uh, is a different type of attack where what you're attacking is not the private data, but you're attacking the um, we're not attacking individual records, but you're trying to understand properties of the training data, like what percentage of men over 50 had diabetes in the training data. Now, as in terms of composing these, um, yeah, the idea there is if you can learn information about the training data, especially information about the training data that might be different than the same statistics about the general population, then you might be able to use that information to do a membership inference attack to figure out is it more or less likely that a particular point was actually used in the training data. And then finally, you have this idea of a model extraction where you're trying to infer properties of, of the model itself. Obviously, this is only an attack if the entire model is not released. Um, and you could be trying to infer um, the architecture, if it's a neural network, or the parameter values, if it's a parametric model, or perhaps not the, about the model itself, but about the learning algorithm such as the hyperparameters used. And the idea here is, again, you know, yes, all of these go together because if you can extract a duplicate of the model 
um, now you can bypass this API, or perhaps it's not a duplicate, but it's a substitute model with enough fidelity, then you can uh, ask this model as many questions as you want. It doesn't have an API. And so um, that goes in line with these factors to consider in, in privacy, like composition. If, if, you, if somebody's allowed to ask enough non-redundant queries of the data, eventually privacy will be breached. Um, and one of the ideas is the idea of interactive queries where the person who's querying the data you know, um, chooses each query based on the responses that they've already received in, a, in some sort of a, a strategy to try to breach privacy in the minimum number of queries. And so, you know, both of those are examples of, of why you would, in theory, would desire to do model extraction, because if they can extract a model or a good, um, all, you know, close enough representation of the model, then they can compose as many queries as they want and ask whatever they want in order to try to do those other attacks. Um, so, and then I guess lastly, I'll just say that um, one other case that I'm interested in is um, something I think my research group has done in the past, which is um, perhaps not release the entire model, but train a model which you hope is privacy preserving, and then use that model to generate synthetic data. And then that allows you to run additional tests on that synthetic data before you release that synthetic data to the external environment. Now, I'm very curious, and I think my research group is, is going to continue to, to look into what additional tests can you run, because I think that's a very complicated question. Um, you know, there's a, a big difference between uh, computing some statistics and saying that you think that privacy is maybe preserved. And you know, actually somehow rigorously proving with some sort of a bound on how much information an adversary can get. And so I'm still trying to look into what what are the tests that people use. Um, but that's the end of my talk. Please ask any questions that you have. Hopefully I talk too fast. Yes, yeah, no, thanks. That was very useful. Uh, I remember this whole list actually of uh, attacks that uh, we we, uh, we came up with. Did you mention in the in the past, or did you try to uh, uh, categorize them in the into your new categories? I missed some of your talk at the beginning. I'm sorry because I didn't have the WebEx link. No, I, yeah, I think a lot of the attacks that that we came up with that one day um, were just um, different names for the same type of attack. And then I just would be interested in in, in knowing the, uh, uh, the the synonyms, right? If you could put uh, oh, yeah. the lexicon where you yeah. say, okay, that's this means that, and this is just a synonym for that. And... Um, No, not now, not, not necessarily. I, I was wondering whether you talked about it before, and I missed it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just I just shared that um, there's something called membership inference, which is the same as tracing. Yeah, th that's in my talk, and then also that attribute inference is the same as reconstruction, which is the same as model inversion. Um, so most of the the examples that I think we listed that one day were yeah all synonyms. Some of them were just specific examples. Of attacks that fall into the different categories. So yeah, okay. I mean, if but I anybody think if you knows, write up something, you know, it, it would be useful to uh, to systematically make an inventory and then put these, you know, all these different kinds of uh, names that people use uh, into these categories that you created to clarify things so that people know, you know, that this, these are not different. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm definitely still working on that. Um, one thing that I didn't cover um, was uh, in Rogaki and Garcia's paper, they did, they did mention the idea of distributed learning. And it seems like that's an active area of research, privacy preservation and distributed learning. Um, but I didn't have time to really fully grasp that. It's not an area of expertise of mine. So it does seem like th there, are, there is a lot of work being done in this area. Um, but this paper that I um, got most of my information from uh, just came out last summer. 
So, so Matt, I, I wonder about the property inference attack. Is um, is it called this way? What kind of a property are you? I mean, proper, by property, they mean just a, a, an attribute? Well, so it's not an attribute of a particular record in the data. Instead, it's like a statistic on the training data. So, for example, if you're able to determine what percentage of patients in the training were male versus female, um, or what percentage of men in the training data had type 2 diabetes or something like that, um, so you're not inferring anything about a particular record. An attribute inference would be, you know, you infer that for a particular row in the database, uh, a value of some of the one of the columns. Um, I see. I see. Yeah, 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 I remember we discussed that. So it's it's uh, uh, it's in case there is some sample bias and yeah. in the data in the training data, and then you'd be able to say something as a whole about the training data uh, from. The, the synthetic data you were doing. Yeah. yeah, and then, um, you know, it seems to me like that in and of itself wouldn't be a breach of any individual's privacy. But I think the idea then is if you can learn this, these properties of the training data, that will help you to be better at doing like a membership inference attack. So if, if I could interject, you know, one of the things, um, Joe, that I, I think... I think several of the people on the call are are familiar with different anonymization techniques, you know, kind of privacy preserving techniques. And so we kind of have um, a frame of reference for how some of this is done. Um, but I, I think in general, you're, um, if if you were to if you were to do this talk again, <laughs> what you what you might want to do is just uh, talk a little bit. Uh, you know, after you introduce this notion of of the privacy, you know, what you did up front, which was excellent, kind of do just briefly talk about you know some of the methods that are alleged to um, to anonymize or preserve. And then kind of use that as a as a sort of a basis for your examples as you go along to kind of anchor and, and kind of show you know th think back to that you know figure one when I showed you these attributes and this is what it would mean to you know uh, infer attributes on this or think back to this example of how we're um, like it's it's not clear to me exactly. Wow, the, the circumstances oh, yeah. under which you would try to mask the properties of the data set such that you would want to infer the properties, <laughs> and that would be privacy revealing. You know that that that's kind of a construction that I'm I'm having a hard time boiling down the abstraction. I don't want to go into it now, but I think anchoring a little bit with uh, you know some and kind of carry the example through. I'm sorry, I'm getting into kind of this is kind of a meta a meta criticism, <laughs> but, but it would help in, in, in terms of, because what, what it leaves to me, you know, I've, I've been looking at privacy stuff for a very long time. I'm kind of juggling different, uh, different examples in my head as we go through to try to say, okay, this matches what he's saying here. And this matches what he's saying here. And mm -hmm. I'm not, I, 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 uh, um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of channeling a little bit of Jim Hendler here in that I, I criticize because I care. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, if I didn't care, I'd be saying, hey, great talk, Joe. Let's get the know. But, you know, but, I, I, but I'm, I'm kind of picking at this to try to make sure that you're, you, when you talk about this, you're really rock solid on, on making sure that, that the listener gets everything. Um, um, I, I think... I I I don't want to interrupt the flow of questions, but I think you know we've gone an hour, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm going to ask um, if people want to get in touch with Joe, please um, email email him or or email me, and I'll make contact with Joe. This video will also be available through the Idea site. Um, and Isabel, I'll make sure. I know you have the slides now, but I'll make sure you 
you have the link to it after I post it in the next 24 hours or so, um, so you can watch his beginning. Um, and with that, uh, let's thank Joe. Mm -hmm. um, and let me turn off the recording. Um, and it